Hey everyone, good evening. Next one up, and I think that's the, the last talk in this room for today, is the GSOC panel. Um, so that's not about me, that's about uh, the students who are just coming up here, Hannah and Paris. Um, and just make a few words and then hand over um, to the wonderful students. So GSOC, um, on your chance you don't know what it is, um, it's short for Google Summer of Code. It's an international uh, program that's sponsored by Google. We're grateful for that. Google, thank you for many, many years of sponsoring wonderful projects. Um, there was some change this year. It used to be for students uh, only, like properly enrolled students at university. Uh, it changed so from this year on. It's from anyone 18 years uh, or older. Um, there's a little asterisk there. So, uh, they say like without any, let's say, massive open source prior experience, so kind of newcomers to open source. Um, and uh, Google is funding um, both the organization with a bit of money and uh, predominantly the students. Projects can be of uh, two sizes, between 180-ish and 350 hours, and has to happen over the course of the summer and late autumn. Um, yeah, it scaled up massively. So started 2005. Uh, LibreOffice has been part of that since the beginning, and it's now. I, I don't have the numbers from this year, but it's. It used to be like 1,200 something student last year, and more than 200 different open source organizations. So it's really quite large, and it's an honor to be part of that. Um, Right, so for this year, uh, we have um, two students that um, Google was sponsoring and um, um, people here were mentoring. Uh, first of all, big shout out for the mentors, uh, Tomas, Miklos, Hossein. I hope I didn't forget, I don't know if um, um, Mike, maybe you were also helping with mentoring. So all the mentors, all the people reviewing code, um, massive thank you uh, for doing that. We couldn't do that without you. Uh, and of course, people like doing the boring stuff in the background, like uh, organization and payment and form filling, etc. That's Heiko and, uh, and Mari predominantly. Um, right, and that out of the way, um, let's start with some student presentations, like showing off their, um, their wonderful work here. Um, and so we start with Hannah, um, who worked on PBA macro tests and improvements. So, um, with a warm applause, welcome Hannah. Hello. For the people I haven't met, I'm Hannah, nice to meet you. Um, uh, yeah, so my uh, Google Summer of Code was the VBA macros test and missing API, so I basically had to do um, a lot of tests. And the first thing I wanted to say um, was that to start with, it's quite difficult to get into it because like, one of the prerequisites for um, GSOC was you had to do a level interesting difficulty, easy hack, um, and they were all quite difficult, uh, I found anyway, especially being quite new to, well, relatively new to coding and stuff. Um, like a lot of them had quite a lot of comments and I think for starting off, uh, the barrier to entry is quite high and it would be brilliant if more people could file some easier, easy hacks to get more people um, like me uh, interested. Yeah, so for example, this one, like like 46 comments you have to read through before even getting started, and like the easy hacks being deleted, so it's a bit questionable whether it is an easy hack or not. It's just stuff like that um, I found quite challenging. Um, yeah, so I just want to talk about a bit about what macros are used for. I mean, you probably already know, but I just wanted to like quickly skip over it. Um, so yeah, just way of automating tasks, and you can read. So yeah, um, but they are useful. Um, so this was uh, what my project was mainly focusing on: basically writing my tests in Word, testing them in Writer, and then seeing. Um, where there were areas to improve the code or where there were bugs and things didn't work um, as well as I wanted them to or as well uh, like they didn't work the same in Word as they worked in Writer. Um, so yeah, and these are just some code paths as well. Um, so this is just 
a bit about the like the structuring of the code. So you yeah you start with your macro and then you can look at the the VBA API and then the um, normal Uno API. So mostly I was just writing tests um, in the macros, but then I did change some code um, like in the VBA section of uh, LibreOffice and then. Yeah, but I didn't really get into the core, but I liked doing the coding more in LibreOffice rather than in VBA writing the tests because it was just more fun. Um, yeah, VBA is not the most interesting language I didn't find, um, but yeah. Um, and then why is this useful for compatibility? Uh, that's basically the main thing and also like preventing regressions. Um, yeah, I guess people use the macros as well, so it's good just to keep just keep improving stuff. Um, it's just an example test script. Uh, yeah. Um, um, and then this is like, so uh, this is just an example of what you'd expect. So in Word, if you did this, uh, so I wrote a macro to do this. Uh, so you'd expect um, there to be the same thing uh, in Writer, but in Writer, you'd expect this, but actually it doesn't work because there's no characters property. So it's just stuff like that I was trying to fix or like realize. Um, yeah, that still actually needs to be done. So if anybody wants to volunteer to add that, or you know, it's on my to-do list. So, um, And these are just some of the test documents I did. So I tried to pick uh, areas that I thought would be quite useful to cover the most ground. So I didn't focus super a lot on like one area. I tried to move around quite a bit just to get the most use out of my summer, I guess. Um, this is just an example test, I think. Um, uh, so then this is what I did, uh, just some like bullet points of main things I did. I had to add it in all my test files. Um, I fixed some some uh, things that I found that fixed some bugs, really. Um, added some properties. Um, yeah, and then, so I, one of the things I did also was add my test framework. So now I can just have like a nice array of my tests and then they run and then I can see which ones work and stuff. And so you can notice like some of these are commented out because not all of them pass. Um, yeah, so there's still lots to do. Um, yeah, so some of my interesting changes, so one of my changes, obviously this isn't the whole change, but um, was that new uh, find objects. So the find object, I was looking at find and replace, I wrote some tests um, for that, and this find object was constantly being like um, deleted. So for every property that was set on it, it was just like created and destroyed, it wasn't that useful. So um, I made this more global, and then yeah, one of the really useful things I did was have this message box. I know it's only a small bit of code, but like it was really helpful because my debugger, I just gave up with the debugger. It's just too hard um, to like fix. So um, I, I use mostly like printf debugging and stuff. But this showed um, so in VBA you can write a message box and then it's like a it shows what's happening basically. And um, yeah, so this displayed the contents, which was really, really useful. So hopefully for the next person that tries to do some more of this, this can help them as well. Um, yeah, just some key things I've learned. Um, yeah, op option explicit, I wanted to talk about like that. So uh, in VBA, like you call your function names and they don't automatically update when you change them. So there'd be times where I'd try to run my code and I'd be like, why is this not working? Um, but the option explicit updates uh, your function like names and whatever they're called if you've changed your case. So that was actually really helpful. Um, yeah, there's just loads to do. I mean, there are, yeah, loads to do still. Um, yeah, so there's like over 300 objects um, in Word, just looking at their documentation and each of these have loads of properties and methods as well. So, I mean, I couldn't possibly do all of that. Um, uh, but yeah, so there's just, there's a lot to do. And also I don't know what objects are really used and um, the most useful to implement and stuff like, stuff like that. So that needs more research. And some tests still need fixing and stuff, but yeah. Uh, 
yeah, here's just an example where a word behaves strangely, like inserting new lines, um, for unknown reasons to me anyway. Um, if anybody has any views about that, I thought it might be to do with the cursors, but I don't know, MX text view cursors. Just looking at the code quickly, but uh, yeah, there's to do still. So, and the next thing is just thank you to my lovely mentors and the community and for inviting me as well. I've had a lovely time and it was nice to meet you all. Um, any questions? Hello. I take it back. Uh, the example you, you gave about, about the, the missing property, the character's property, so that sounds like something um, that was not, uh, you know, less of a bug and more of something that was like an incomplete API coverage. So is it, so are you testing something that was supposed to have been completed and, and, and this was missed or, or, or is the functionality of, you know, being able to run a VPA uh, macros only partial, partially implemented and your tests are telling us what's missing? Um, yeah, so my tests, yeah, can you hear me in that? Yeah. Okay. My tests, um, so they were testing what bits um, of the API were missing to implement as well as finding bugs. So there were some, sometimes when I changed, like there was an off by one error, so I'd change that to make it um, compatible. But that, yeah, so there are still a lot of missing parts of the API and I was also trying to find those and see where we could like push and, and uh, write more new areas as well. So like there are a lot of methods missing from a lot of objects. Um, yeah, the, yeah, it's quite incomplete, but it's, quite difficult I found to document it because there are just there's just so much. Um, yeah. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Okay. So thanks again Hannah. Awesome stuff. Um, and next one up is uh, Paris with, uh, let me just display that, with extend Z compressed graphic support. And um, slides are coming up in a second. <coughs> and the stage is yours, Paris. Hello again. Uh, so one thing you probably noticed immediately is that I don't have the beautiful LibreOffice slides. So that's sad. Um, but I, I promise I searched for them, I couldn't find them. Anyway, uh, my project is Extend Z Compressed Graphic Format Support. And, well, there is a line in the title. Uh, the formats are gzip compressed, but the title was chosen already. Um, so what can you do? Uh, so if we can take this title word by word, uh, the extend word is because SVGZ import was already supported. So we added a couple more formats, uh, which are WMZ and EMZ, which were not previously supported. So what is a WEMF, WMF or an EMF? We need to understand that before we move on to the uh, WMZ. So it's a Windows meta file and an enhanced meta file. Uh, they're vector graphic formats, a lot like SVG. Uh, they're drawn by meta file record structures that include drawing commands, object properties, and configuration settings. That means uh, you have this meta file structure in the file. It tells you draw a polygon here, and when you play back the file, it draws it there, a lot like SVG. Uh, if you're wondering why they exist in the first place, well, they both came before SVG, and uh, I mean, they're still used because they're used in uh, competitor pro products. Um, so, what is WMZ and EMZ? Well, it's just a gzip compressed WMF or EMF. That's just it. So. A WMF file, you take it, you gzip compress it, and it's now a WMZ. You change the extension as well. Well, of course, as you know, this can reduce the file size by a lot. Um, I would say that it was more useful in the past because of slow internet speeds, uh, no HTTP compression, or uh, uh, you know, floppy disks. You need to share the graphics there. Um, but it 
is still used. Uh, it exists in all documents, so we need to preserve it and we need to support it. And uh, importing SVGZ was already supported, but exporting was not. So we had to add that as well. So here's the work done. Uh, we added WMZ and EMZ format detection support by decompressing the first few bytes. You don't want to decompress the entire thing and then it turns out it's not a WMF. So you decompress the first, you check it, and then you decompress the rest. And then, uh, you know, import and export support, uh, as we said. So decompression uh, supported the gzip format. Uh, there is a Z codec uh, class that supported the the format when you decompress, but after you compress, the gzip uh, header was not added. Um, so we had to fix that as well. And then uh, unit tests. Quite a lot of them, but not as much as Thomas would want. <laughs> uh, actually, that project was quite small. Uh, I started during the uh, community bonding period, which is three weeks uh, this year. I don't know why. Uh, it's quite a lot, so I started coding because I got bored. Uh, so we moved on to a bonus project, uh, which was make PNG writer use libpng. Uh, the reader was already converted to libpng. Uh, we had the, our own implementation before, uh, and Thomas had already started working on the writer. So he suggested that I continue his work, and I did. Uh, I continued Thomas's work, had support for several chunks that were missing, uh, RGBA and one and eight bit palette support, and we added uh, some uh, PNG suite tests. PNG suite is like uh, this. Uh, uh, zip of a uh, bunch of PNGs, it tests for everything, uh, interlacing, different sizes, different palettes, etc. Uh, this is more for consistency because it's a little bit harder to test that the file is actually open and the pixels are actually the way they're supposed to be. Uh, so we would just import the tests, uh, check the size, check out that everything is alright, and export them and check that they match. Uh, and then, at the end, uh, remove the old PNG writer and fully integrate the new writer. And that is it. Uh, so the conclusion and the final thoughts of the project. Well, LibreOffice has been a great introduction to open source. It is the first open source community that I've been a part of. Uh, the community is very knowledgeable and always eager to help. Whenever I would go on IRC, mails, etc., uh, there was always someone who knew exactly what I wanted. Um, it greatly improved my code writing and especially my code reading skills. Um, it was fun, obviously, and yeah, I hope to continue contributing for years to come. Uh, that is all. Thank you for listening. Hello. Hello. If you can only outline like what we had there before the LPNG for the export. Uh, there was uh, our own implementation, just like the reader. It didn't use uh, libpng. So writing the headers ourselves. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, so now we have uh, support for working with the compressed versions of uh, PNGs, of SVGs, right? I think you mentioned the VMF, the WMFs, and and the the OD whatever formats are themselves uh, compressed. Is there? Do you think there's uh, there's justification for something like? a more uh, general framework of some sort for like transparently looking into um, uh, uh, compressed files so that we could like generically support com compressed versions of additional formats or is that uh, or is that overkill yes so this was actually one of the first things i considered um uh, i messaged thomas about this and i asked him you know uh, why don't we support everything that is gzip compressed? But it turns out nothing else is really gzip compressed, and at the end of the day, uh, the user just uncompressed it. The reason uh, that we need support for WMZ, say for example, WMZ, WMZ is inside a document, well, you cannot, you cannot uncompress it inside the document, but if it's a pdf.gz, you can always uncompress that. And also, there's like, no other formats that use well, compression, as far as I know. Well, script is often uh, used to compress, or sometimes 
Okay, any further questions? We've got a few minutes left, so there is one. Look at that sprinting action. Thank you, Claude. Um, yes, it's not a question for you, Paris. It's just a general Google Summer of Code question. Um, so I, I'm just interested in the statistics on how many applicants we got, how many got through, wh wh what did the funnel look like, if you can, if you can share that, this year, because normally we have more, and, and what can we do to get, I mean, assuming we'll do Google Summer of Code next year, what can we do to improve that? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I don't have the um, precise numbers, um, and maybe Ilmari might remember. So we had, but we were not the only org this year, we had significantly fewer um, applications, um, and those that we got were from really quite different um, corners. So, so the Google changed the rules quite, quite substantially, and that did apparently affect um, us and other orgs more than, so for example, research, um, uh, open source um, uh, organizations closer to research stuff apparently were f less affected um, because they were probably been, well, they have been recruiting their students f from, let's say, in-house um, and, and they had no prior open source experience. So there was kind of the, 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 the standard, like KDE and other projects, they, they would normally attract students or people who have prior open source experience and that was kind of so, so Google kind of switched from let's have students to let's have everybody but without open source experience and and they they said that they're going to tweak that they're kind of there's going to be some a b testing I suppose so um, they tweak this massively and they're going to tweak it again and then kind of compare like what's worth the optimum I suppose so um, so I think this year is a bit of an outlier. If you look at the numbers like over multiple years, I think you can learn something. But if you look at this year, I think this is, this is an outlier. And, and on the other hand, well, of course, the, the, the other limiting factor beyond um, having applic applicants, like, like people who are obviously like passing the test and then like being considered um, um, valid applications, there's the other side, that's the mentoring side. Um, and I think we have more of a problem there probably um, going forward. So, so that, that's, mentoring is something that, that takes energy, that takes time. And if you do that like every year since, since 12 years, then, then maybe, you want, maybe you want to break. So that's that. Yeah. I don't know, I think Mari is not here. Anybody else? Cisco, maybe? Anybody from, from the, let's say, um, in a circle um, or any, anything to add to that? I don't want to, I'm not claiming that's, that's, uh, that's necessarily all accurate what I'm saying. Okay, great. Then, um, then thanks a lot to everyone involved, students, mentors, Google for funding it, um, TDF for hosting it, um, and, and all of you um, in the audience for listening. Um, thanks a lot, and uh, I'd say let's, um, let's quit here um, and have five minutes earlier, uh, go for some nice dinner, enjoy the evening, enjoy the rest of the conference. Hope to see you all tomorrow. All the best. Okay.